Who's got a question for Reverend Barber? You have a question for him? Anybody? When did you get interested in politics? Like, when did you start really thinking about this stuff? I got kind of pushed. I was born two days after the March on Washington. Okay. Not long after that, my father and mother decided to go back to the South to help desegregate schools. Because while May 17th was the Brown decision, it wasn't until 1970 that North Carolina began to, to desegregate. That's, that's almost um, 17 years. People forget that history. My entry into civil rights and justice was in my home. My daddy was a pastor, and because he was a pastor, we never separated Jesus and justice. I don't understand how people say, I love Jesus, but I hate people. You know, I love Jesus, but I don't believe in living wages. I love Jesus, but all I care about is prayer in the school and abortion, but I don't care about the poor and sick care. It's contradictory. They put me in segregated school. I went to segregated kindergarten, first grade. That was my entry because my parents made a decision that they were going, not going to stay in the North, but they were coming back home and fight racism. They used you to desegregate a school, a public school? I was a part of a group. I started school and kindergarten at All Black, and then they moved our class. So we were like the setup class. I didn't go as an individual, but my father helped integrate the science department in the high school, and my mother, who's 83 years old, still goes to work every day, integrated the uh, office at the high school. She's been there over 40 years, uh, and she was the first ever African-American office manager. Is she more welcome today than she was 40 years ago? Well, she tells me now, she says, I, and I'll be honest, I'm going to say what she says. When she came there, they called her nigger, now they call her mama barber. And I asked her, why don't you go home? You're 83 years old. She said, when I came there, they didn't want me. Now I'm going to stay long as I want to stay. <laughs> yeah. I would like to know what you think the biggest problem our community is as a whole and what's the best way to solve that? The biggest thing, I think, is understanding that we cannot work in silos. It's intersectional. It's not one movement over here. If you check the records of the people who are against criminal justice reform, against health care, it's basically the same people. We have to have learn how to work intersectionally. We have to move as a movement. And right now, we have to look at, you know, the, in a democracy, the greatest travesty is when you attack the right to vote. Because the attack the right to vote, it's not just about voting, it's about how do you have the power to influence the political system. And it is, it is a desecration, as I said up there. We've had a thousand days, and this Congress has allowed the Voting Rights Act, the most important legislation in this country, to go dormant, to be, the, to, to be in a sense where preclearance is not enforceable, which means Loretta Lynch has less power than the Attorney General had in 1965. I mean, anywhere else, people would be all in the street. And that's why we have to have people in the street, but not just in D.C., back home. Be, we, movements began from the bottom up, not from the top down. Yeah. So I think in a real sense, the, the attempt of the extremists to suppress the vote and buy the vote is the most traumatic shock to our democracy. But our fight to free the vote is the most powerful movement right now in this moment. In this generation, for changing the future. That they will teach us and we will learn and that they will learn, we will teach them and they will learn that we will not form a false dichotomy, that it's us versus them, that Moses and Joshua can walk together, uh, that we don't have to create the mistakes of the past and then instead we will be a one grand movement. I'm a preacher so I'm looking for Pentecost where the young and the old all come together and work on the common moral issues, constitutional issues and moral issues. And I believe there are five great moral issues, economic sustainability, addressing poverty, labor rights and living wages, education equality for all, health care for all, protecting the environment and women's health, reforming the criminal justice system, and protecting and expanding voting rights, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, immigrant rights, and never giving up on equal protection under the law. I think that's a grand moral agenda. That should not be the agenda of the old or the agenda of the young. It should be the agenda of the freedom fighters. And we don't have to pass the baton when you're dead. That's the thing about a relay race. You still, on, you, literally, there's a place. It's Reverend Dr. William Barber, leader of the Moral Monday Movement. He just spoke here at Democracy Awakening. There's a place on the track where the relayers are running together. So I don't have to die and move out of the way for you to have your place. We can all have a place and move together and learn from each other. Reverend Barber, can you talk about your book, The Third Reconstruction, and kind of bring us to the moment where we are in history today and where it falls in that line? Every young person here, if, if I could ask you one thing, study either my book or Eric Fauna. Go read about the first Reconstruction and how the South changed when blacks and whites came together 
in the 1800s passed some of the most progressive voting laws and educational laws, then it came under attack by an immoral deconstruction calling themselves the Redemption Movement, and they tore it apart. Then read about the second reconstruction from Brown decision to 68, the death with Dr. King, and when blacks and whites and Latinos and young and old people came together, changed this country. The most graphic changes in this country came in the first and second reconstruction. But then in the second reconstruction, there was the attacks, always the same attacks, killing the leaders, cutting taxes, undermining voting, undermining public education, and taking over the courts. Same thing began to happen in 1968. It's a strategy called the Southern Strategy. Then they came up with this thing called the Moral Majority. I'm rushing over a lot of history. But my book talks about this. But here's what it says. If you understand that history, you will understand that right now we are in a third reconstruction. You and I represent the rising, the adolescent stage of a third reconstruction. And the reason the folk there and in these state capitals are fighting us so hard, because they know what happens if a reconstruction comes to full, full adult life. They, they know what happened in the 1800s. It changed. They know what happened in 1900. So they're trying to stifle and stunt this, this, this reconstruction. We can't let it happen. And it has to be built as an intersectional, deeply moral, deeply transformative, anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-justice, moral movement where we move together and we never give up on our democracy. You are the third reconstruction. Now, we, we, we're about this tall, but we must say you're not going to stunt this third reconstruction. We have to continue to push. That's why today is not the beginning of the awakening. The awakening is all this other stuff that's been happening. This is a symbol of the continuous, and it can't stop today because the last thing we need are moments. We need movements. We don't need moments. We need movements. The ending of the first reconstruction what you know it ended in a tremendous wave of violence and terror and it meant that the victors which are basically the former confederate generals and the, and the former planters the former slave owners wrote the history about the first reconstruction and the misconceptions still affect us today How, what can you do to unpack some of that well that's one of the reasons i wrote the book and one of the reasons uh, dr fauna and others are coming back out you're right there's a whole school that wrote that the reconstruction was bad but the reconstruction was deconstructed uh, by those who did not love America m moving more closer to its ideals. So we got to read and we got to teach it and we got to use the language. That's why in the Moral Monday movie we use the language of reconstruction. People told me, don't do that, nobody will know what you're talking about. And I said, and that's a problem. Anybody that doesn't know about the first and second reconstructions, how it was built, how it was deconstructed, and what we need to do now, I don't think you really understand how to fight in this moment. Yeah. So my knowledge is power. The use of knowledge is show enough power. Yeah. And so I'm saying to these, do not, do not, when you come into activism, don't act as though you have to build all the knowledge from zero. Don't ever act like nobody knows anything before you. Know this history and know that it was young people that were the leaders in the first reconstruction and the leaders in the second reconstruction. And you must be leaders in this third reconstruction. And, and lastly, remember what they said in South Africa, only a dying mule kicks the hardest. Sometimes it is the way that your enemy pushes back against you that tells you your own power. If we weren't powerful, they wouldn't be trying to take the right to vote. If we weren't powerful, they wouldn't keep trying to fight, uh, fight for 15. If we weren't powerful, they would not try to buy off elections. They know that this extremism and its hold on this country is dying. And we don't have to be hateful about that. We don't have to hate people. We don't need that. Love and truth are the greatest weapons we have as long as it's connected to an organized movement. You are the reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank Take care. care. Love y'all. Yeah. 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 Right across the right across the